Biodegradable and compostable plastics are cropping up everywhere nowadays as a proposed solution to the plastic crisis that's currently gripping the planet. Compostable cups, wipes and shopping bags are becoming the norm and on the surface of it, it seems like a really good answer to a difficult problem. Plastic is designed to be durable and stick around for a long time, so the idea that we could have something that would eventually just go away seems like a really good one. But I really want to know what biodegradable and compostable actually mean, what happens to them and whether the answer to the plastic crisis is really that simple. One of the biggest misconceptions about these kinds of plastics is that if you put them in your home compost or in landfill or even just litter them, that in a few magical years they will eventually just disappear. And this isn't really how it works. A lot of these things need to be sent to a specialist facility so they can be broken down properly. If you put them in your normal home food waste bin, that's likely to be sent to an anaerobic digester, which normally can't deal with compostable plastic materials. And biodegradable plastic can contaminate your recycling, meaning that none of it will get recycled and it might get incinerated. So there are loads of different types of plastic in this episode that I just quickly wanted to run through so we know what we're talking about. So this is PET, it's a clear plastic, it's really high value and it's really widely recycled. So you could just chuck this in your household recycling and it will probably go to the right place. The next one is plastic film, something like this, which you'll normally find on food packaging. It's really thin, it's great at keeping food fresh, but at the moment it's not really very widely recycled. You can't put this in your household recycling and expect it to get recycled. So this is the kind of thing that we need new solutions and innovations for, or at least a system that can cope with the amount of film that we're producing. These are compostable coffee cups. So the outside is paper, but the inside, where there's a thin plastic film, they've made out of a compostable material. The thing is though, and it says this on the side, that it's commercially compostable where accepted. So you can't just put it in your home compost. I don't have anything biodegradable to show you because you had to buy them in packs of 50 and I didn't think it would be very environmentally friendly to buy something that we were never going to use again. But I will show you a picture of one. Because everyone is looking for a solution to the plastic problem, a lot of brands are being asked, why don't you just make the switch to biodegradable plastic? But as we've learned again and again and again, decisions that we make in a hurry aren't usually the best solutions. I don't know that much about this topic myself, so I have turned to an expert and we're gonna go and meet Dr. Richard Thompson, who is a professor of marine biology at the University of Plymouth, and hopefully he can fill in some of the science for us. Um, so thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, my first question to you is, what are biodegradable and compostable plastics? Well, there's actually a whole range of different materials out there on the market that are designed to, to degrade perhaps more rapidly than let's say conventional plastics. Mm -hmm. and, and that's almost part of the problem really. Plastics are a real success story, <laughs> but one of the four successes are their durability. You can rely on them in service, whether that's holding a fizzy drink or a packet of crisps or as part of an aeroplane. But that then creates a problem when those items become litter in the environment. And so there's a whole range of materials out there with enhanced rates, or at least the intention of enhanced rates, of degradation. So it's, it's almost, to me, an impossible challenge to have something that's going to degrade sufficiently fast in the natural environment to help to fix the problem of marine litter. In our recent research was what happens to some of these materials if they do end up in the natural environment. So we looked at bags that were labelled as degradable, biodegradable and compostable, as well as some conventional plastics. These are all carrier bags and we exposed them in the sea, we buried some in the soil in the University of Plymouth Garden and we had some exposed to the air. And after three years um, some of those bags, despite being labelled as biodegradable, for example, you can still carry shopping home in them. Three years is a really long time for nothing to have happened to them. Well, there were some measurable changes in, let's say, the tensile strength, but you could still use that carrier bag to carry home your shopping. Mm -hmm. So what are these materials actually made from? Because a lot of them say plant-based, and I'm not really sure what that means. So we've got Traditionally, plastic's made from a carbon source from fossil oil and gas, okay? And it's that fossil oil and gas that's going to become the carbon source. There's an alternative that you could use carbon from plants grown in agriculture, which at the face of it seems like a more sustainable option because we could grow more plants to, to replace the ones that we use in making the plastics. So it's what you might call a renewable source of carbon, unlike the fossil oil and gas. So the problem is that switching the carbon source to using carbon from plants rather than fossil oil and gas 
does nothing to solve the problem of the accumulation of waste or the accumulation of litter. The challenge with plastics is we're using them in a linear way, whichever the carbon source is, over 300 million tonnes of plastic used every year, 40% of that is going into single-use applications, which are rapidly accumulating as waste mm -hmm. and as litter, and they're not degrading at any meaningful rate. So switching the carbon source on its own won't solve the problem of marine yeah. litter. And, and ultimately, I'd argue that the carbon source we really need to be using for our new plastics is the waste that we're generating, the end of life plastics becoming new plastics via recycling because that would actually decouple us from fossil oil and gas as a feedstock for the carbon and it would mean that we weren't having to devote large areas of land to growing plants in agriculture in order to fuel that, that li linear economy of, of, of plastic through short-lived applications to waste. So to me that's a long-term answer is to move to more circularity. In summary, to solve the problem of the accumulation of plastic waste and plastic litter, we need to be pulling on a lot of levers simultaneously. We need to be reducing unnecessary use of plastics in the first place. We need to be reusing plastic items wherever we possibly can. We need to make sure, of course, that we're not dropping litter, whatever the kind of plastic it is, and ideally that we're choosing plastics that are compatible with recyclability at their end of their lifetime. And in some applications, we should be thinking about compostable or biodegradable solutions. But today, with over 300 million tonnes of plastic being produced every year, we really need to design for end of life, whether that's via recycling, whether it's via compostability. In some applications, it might be via incineration. You think of perhaps hospital waste that's heavily contaminated. But we need to envisage what does end of life look like right from the design stage. And, and actually, that is going to vary a little bit geographically according to the waste management infrastructure that's available you know the UK and Europe is going to be very diff different to some developing nations yeah. and so we need to factor that in as well but in my view we could achieve an awful lot by thinking of some of the 20 mainstream products and what happens to them at their end of life we don't need hundreds of different solutions but we need a palette of solutions that delivers functionality but also delivers at end of life to reduce this crisis of the accumulation of waste and litter Perfect, thank you so much. One of my biggest takeaways from all of this research is that switching out normal plastic for biodegradable or compostable plastic isn't really solving the problem of plastic pollution. We're just switching out one kind of plastic for another kind of plastic that we don't really have the infrastructure to be able to deal with properly. Obviously, if it goes to the right place and you're in the right system, biodegradable and compostable plastic really has a space, but it isn't the entire answer. One of the good things about ordinary recyclable plastic is that it's really high value. We can use it again and again, and we have the infrastructure to be able to recycle it. So like Dr. Thompson said, I wonder if what we should be doing is starting to look at how we can use the material already in existence to create more material that we need. There are loads of innovations being made in this space, from packaging that you can eat to stuff that dissolves in water in only a few weeks, and I'm sure in the future we're going to see some incredible things coming out of this space. In the meantime, switching out one kind of product for another kind of product isn't really going to solve the problem of us using too much stuff in the first place. We need to have a major overhaul of our entire system, thinking about where reusables come in, how we can use materials that we already have, and make sure that things stay in a circular system. Problems like these are complex and they're nuanced and there isn't always, there isn't ever, one solution to be able to fix everything. It's going to take a lot of work to make really common sense, well-researched decisions that are sustainable, fit into your life and are good for the planet and our oceans but it is worth doing. If you need any more information about anything that we've spoken about today, check all the links that I've put in the description. Thank you so much for watching and coming on this journey of research with us, and I will see you next time. And that's the end of the episode. To find out more and to get inspired, head to our website, www.hubbub.org.uk, where you'll find loads of top tips to give you the spark to do things differently. Tune in for the next episode and come and join the Hubbub.